Hello, it's Maxine. <laughs> Today I'm going to do another Jubilee Media video um, based on questions in one of their videos. Do all suicide survivors think the same with Spectrum Media or Spectrum Jubilee Media? <laughs> um, my story is that uh, I grew up in a very um, I have a hard time saying very abusive environment because um, like the physical abuse was more so when I was younger and then sort of ended when I was getting older but I strongly believe it's only because um, they valued their own um, freedom more than the desire to hurt me. Like they wanted to hurt me. They threatened to hurt me all the time. There were some occasions, um, there's some really horrific stuff I experienced when I was a lot younger, but once I got to the age where I could kind of defend myself and they knew that if they had done anything, they were going to be like gonna have to face it one way or another because they had a government job and stuff like that so um you know when you're a victim like but every sing single day was abusive in the other way where it's like verbally and um just making threats of violence and like every single day and I don't want to say specifics about what type of phrases and stuff were used because I don't want to um, like really trigger anyone. But I'm just going to say that every day it just felt like walking on eggshells. And when I was really young, I wasn't allowed to play. Like um, if I made noise, it was like I would get in trouble and sometimes hit and then uh so something that kind of came back to me as I was getting help for the first time is that like I remember walking like we lived in a hundred year old house and I remember walking on the my cat's doing something walking on the baseboards like as like trying to step without making a single creak in the floor and like being still like a statue and my heart like racing like <sighs> that was something I had to do a lot and um like it's really tough because the one of the reasons why I suppressed all of the abuse and trauma for so long is because I know that some people had had it worse and but when it comes to your experience and your existence, like you still have to, well, many of us still have to like go and reach out for help at some point or another. And although physical abuse in some ways may like in my mind, that is worse, but, um, the manipulation, the like keeping fam, like, the control aspect, the, um, like putting certain family members against each other. Like it ruined me, my mom's relationship. It ruined me, my sibling's relationship because he wanted me to be the bad one when he was the one making all the poor decisions. And, uh, um, you know, with like, all his addictions and stuff like gambling, chain smoking, drinking, cheating. Um, there's a lot of neglect where I was left alone a lot. Like there was a, they never let me forget it that apparently they were in the backyard when I was going door to door to neighbors asking where my parents was. And I had looked all over the entire house and in the backyard and in the garage and everywhere. And that was something that happened like a lot of times when I was like very young 
and we lived on a busy street where I'd be like crossing the street to go ask neighbors where my parents was and my dad was having an affair with one of the neighbors so anyway I said I wasn't gonna say too many specifics and now I feel obligated to say a lot more because when you say oh you know the physical abuse kind of ended as I got older well it was like an everyday threat and like real like scary actions that he would take to like make me freeze and <sighs> make me stop talking or whatever it was um I think one of the reasons why it feels so good to stim now as an adult with autism is because when I was younger I wasn't allowed to make noise and do the things I needed to do to like self-regulate my emotions and so yes um, um just really difficult to like really put all into words um there are some there's some things that has come back to me as I got older including sexual abuse and I strongly believe that that must have ended around an age where I was able to start speaking up against it because um like I said the physical abuse was there and then gradually less it was more threats and he would even say things like hit me so he can claim self-defense and he said that so many times when I was younger and I in my head I used to think that he meant oh if he hits if I hit him and he hits me back and the police come or something then he can claim self-defense or something <laughs> But as I got older, I realized that he's saying that if he, like, kills me in self-defense. So, like, it's just really fucked up. And, um... Ah, that just really got to me. Because I was just, um, like, I, it was like nobody on the outside understood what was going on. And even my own mother, I thought that she knew everything that was happening. But it was like, she was at work. He worked nights. And their schedules were opposite. She would go, sometimes have to go on, like, work trips. And she would, like, go visit friends in Toronto and Thunder Bay and, like, there was extended periods where the neglect and abuse was worse, where it was like, I don't know if I was able to express like what everything was going on. And, um, but, uh, yeah, we'll just say like lots of suppression of what, like everything from emotions to, um, memories. I really didn't think that there was anything like, what had come back to me that I could possibly forget but when you're just so young and you don't even re like you don't even know what all of that is then how can you explain what had happened to you so um you know like I was a lit <laughs> just in terms of the um neglect like it was everything from poor nutrition to sometimes starving because of the addiction habits and there being only condiments in the fridge then there's the aspect of being alone quite often left alone to my own devices where I could have got seriously hurt and some for some reason it's like I had a younger sibling and I just don't hardly remember them being there it was really weird so we were both like I was an autistic kid like in my own world doing my own thing and then I was left to babysit my little sibling three years younger than me. I don't know what they were doing half the time. So we were both in danger. And uh, I forget where I was going with that. Um, oh, the neglect. So. I 
forget what I was going to specifically say because once I start talking about things it's like it all comes on like a flood of emotions and memories but um neglect is everything from that to health care where it's like I had a serious ear infection and I was forced to go out of the home um like to watch fireworks for new year's or something and I even think I have like a bit of like harder hearing on one side than the other and I feel like I can fully hear and but I have a very strange I don't know what kind of disorder where I can barely make out words and songs and stuff like that and I don't know what it has to do with it could be because I was constantly in an environment where music was blaring and stuff with the drinking or what but um yeah, that's one of my problems, is like not being able to hear words and songs, even songs I've heard like a thousand times. I don't know. But, um, oh, I wish I could remember what I was saying with that. Um, anyway, probably for another time. So, I kind of remember what I was going to say now. So like, um, not being taught how to read, write, tie my shoes, ride a bike, anything. It was always like exterior people, like neighbors and friends and family, like teaching me how to do things. Like I remember I was nine years old and my nine year old friend taught me how to tie my shoes. <laughs> so I was autistic, but I was also it's just like I did not matter. My life did not matter. My, there was n no patience, no love, no understanding, no, no, um, parenting. I feel like I just raised myself essentially or everyone else around me, not them. Um, but what I was going to say is like, I was 11 years old and I'm sure before age 11, we learned about some sexual health in school, but it didn't really register with me and I never had that conversation with my parent, like my parent, my mom especially. And it's like when I first got my period, I had no idea what even happened. <laughs> like I woke up and I thought I had been like stabbed or something. So, um, yeah, just like all those things, those milestones and like all those important conversations you have with your kids just all of none of that ever happened for me I always felt like I was learning things several steps behind everyone and uh but um yeah it's just a lot and I'm sorry to the people who go through worse and physical abuse, but, um, like I'm right there with you in terms of the emotional and manipulation and narcissism and, and, you know, at times it was like, it was enjoy enjoyable for them to make me cry, like never support, never like there for me at all when I needed them and it's like and then as I got older it's like well why aren't you hugging your mom your mom does so much for you and it's like well because she was not there for me like I don't feel comfortable like and that's one thing in every relationship like friendship I always noticed how this could be an autistic thing or it could just be due to my environment but it's like I always noticed how friends were just so close and they could just hang off each other and hug each other and like there's that closeness and I always felt like I was I had like a bubble around myself and it was hard for me to show any sort of affection it was hard for me to like even say things like I love you to people in my life and stuff so but back to these questions um and really, like, um, actually, I should say that the abuse and everything didn't just end at home. It was like I was bullied in school, even by educators. 
I was bullied by my own friends because I just didn't under like that was the type of love I was receiving at home so I think that's the type of people I seeked out and like do I fully blame kids for that like no that's their environment but um Whenever there was someone that was like truly genuine and nice that wanted to get to know me, it always seemed like I would like be like, okay, what do you want from me? Like it didn't seem, it seemed so fake and phony because like there are people who are truly like that and I was only used to getting bullied. So it was just, um, yeah, really tough, but, uh, okay. I want to get back to these questions. I want to sort of, I wanted to say sort of like a little bit of a backstory. Oh, and another thing, um, because these questions are based on being a survivor of suicide, I wanted to say that I actually, not only, but I was very young and I actually can't even tell you the exact age. I don't know if it was like 11, 12 or 13, but it was sometime in those years somehow I don't remember that but um I had one and only attempt and I was just so down so hurt felt so alone so isolated I just wanted the pain to stop and um I'm not going to tell you exactly what I did but the method I would have chosen would have been I think I did actually mention in another video so trigger warning but like I had an, I don't want to cry, but, um, I just had like a knife at my throat and I was just so young that so stupid, like, but just a child in so much pain that I didn't know that even with all my might, if I had gone that, tried that way, I probably would have survived and who knows where I'd be today due to that action like hospitalized medicated gone down maybe a completely different path and not helped because regardless of what the situation was going to be even if I was put into foster care we all hear horror stories of foster care so it was like like that suicide attempt wasn't going to stop my parents actions they just were beyond help because they wouldn't help themselves so um but yeah I had a little scar even to this day it's like a teeny tiny faint scar and I thought it was disappearing but it is there still and it's like just a constant reminder of that and like in some ways I'm glad that you know I did go forward with it and I tried but I was just so weak and so sad and so depressed and that and so young that even when I thought I was giving it the hardest blow I could it wasn't enough and anyway I know that's completely oversharing but I just wanted to express that like you really have to get to a really low point to do that especially as a child like Anyway, the thing about that is um, I had expressed maybe around that time. So this might have been in grade 7 or grade 8. I can't remember exactly. It's sort of a blur. But um, I did, I don't know if I told my mom that I was depressed and I wanted to die before I attempted or if it was after. But I didn't tell her that I did attempt. No one actually knew until I was like in my late 20s when I got help for the first time and I don't think my mom knew that I even did it and she's like the one and only person pretty much I've told like maybe a handful of friends in my life but not when I was younger not until much later in life but um you know when I first reached out for help actually I was a child and she you know was just like it's not a big deal or get over it or like she just thought I was being dramatic like just really cruel and um maybe I said it enough times where I did go and see this like 
family doctor and they gave me a medication and it was like, they gave me something that wasn't even for any sort of psychiatric help. It's like they gave me a placebo or something and I guess in my head I thought it worked. <laughs> but the stuff was still going on at home so I mean... I don't know what that says exactly, but maybe things had eased up when I finally got on this medication or I don't know, but, or things were better at school or maybe I just had a stronger will to live after my attempt or I just don't, or no, like, but that was the last time I was on medication, like besides, you know, what we all go through in life, like antibiotics and stuff. I was given other medications like late into my 20s when I finally had like a full-on meltdown and breakdown about my childhood and but every time I took something it just made me feel sick and I'm just like I'm not willing to trade what I feel when I know it's just based on what was done to me and stuff versus like side effects and I know that's wrong because I know there's people out there who need medication and it does help but just for me I've always tried to find a way without it whether it was like at times losing weight or I think having pets like having my cats and dogs has always helped having a purpose but um I want to finally get to these questions I just kind of wanted to explain that um I that was my one and only attempt but the suicidal ideations continued all the way from then to when I first got help in my late 20s at, I think, 27. So, um, yeah, it, like, this is why I want to answer these questions, because although I had one attempt, I was very young, and the ideations always stuck with me. I always thought it's a good thing I never had my hands on a gun because I wouldn't be here today. And um, I always was trying to figure out like what would be the quickest, pain, most painless way to go and stuff. So I'm glad I got help at the right time, even though it was much later. Um than some so uh anyway do all suicide survivors think the same spectrum so jubilee media on youtube and i'll link their original video the first question is the media accurately portrays mental health and suicide with that um i can't fully say that I agree with that because I just don't think I've seen one of my very autistic traits is like I will scroll and scroll and scroll for movies on Netflix and all kinds of things and I always end up watching the same thing so in terms of like mental health and suicide I just don't nothing really comes to mind except maybe like girl inter except maybe like girl interrupted um that's kind of my only that's the only thing I can really think I think girl interrupted is one of the only things that like really comes to mind in terms of any sort of talk of suicide and mental health that seems almost true but in terms of anything else I think it's not fully accurately portrayed because people don't, you don't really get a full idea of what's going on inside someone's head. It's usually like just based on how their mood or their actions or something like that. So you never, I don't think, I don't know if it's really accurately portrayed. I mean, in so, like in some cases, yes, you see that they're isolated from others or they, purposely, you know, tend to want to stick to themselves or, um,
I'm not sure exactly, but I'll, it's not, it's hard for me to really say, so I would just say neutral. Because I have seen some accurate representation, but I haven't seen everything out there or enough. Um, and, I mean, movies are meant to be dramatic sometimes. In, like in true life sometimes it's not this big explosion it's just kind of like this dull line like getting through life and having these feelings and some highs and lows are not as much um anyway it's kind of impossible to put into like a movie or something but Next is, my family understands why I wanted to end my life. Um, like I said, I ha barely told anybody, maybe just in these last few years. And I don't feel like, I don't feel like I'm really heard when I explain anything. <laughs> so maybe they understand, maybe they didn't, but I just don't get that feeling. I can think of like one person who like, would really try to understand. Anytime like I would explain anything to people, it was always like a competition of who had it worse or they know someone who's been through worse and it's like, you have no idea like, okay, what their incidents might've been a lot less, not like a daily thing. And maybe they had more support and people that were there to help guide them in the right direction. Or maybe they got help at a young age that I didn't get. and. You just, and I'm not saying that in a way where it's like, oh, what was me and I have it worse. It's just that you can't compare people's experience. Even if something seems less to you, you just have no idea because you didn't live it. And even when I'm explaining it right now, you're not going to fully grasp the picture. So, but, um, no, I don't think people have ever understood because even just in this last year, like, my own mom would be in denial about things I've told her and she said like that didn't happen and stuff like that and it's like you were not there so how could you possibly say that just um I never thought someone like my mom would be narcissist but apparently so someone who everyone loves and everyone thinks is just so great and amazing and is there for everyone and will like you know, give the sweater off her back to help someone, but for some reason couldn't be there for her own daughter. Like she has helped me in a lot of ways, but has been extremely emotionally abusive as well, just like my father. And I don't know how I'm here today, honestly, when you don't have your mom or your dad or hardly any family. It's just like, wow, I have a strength inside and I guess the whole reason I've survived all this time is to like be here today to share my story with you and hopefully to help others and something I'd like to say is if you're a parent and you know you're not being the best parent you can be for your child and you think you're doing your best or you tell yourself you're doing the best but you're still abusing that child whether it be emotionally physically mentally whatever it is please get help please your child does not deserve it your child does did not ask to be brought into this world to be treated that way and it's going to impact them and some of the things you do you might not even realize are impacting them and why bring a child into this world if later in life they're just going to want to have nothing to do with you essentially you're not going to have a relationship with them like what is the point in all that it's just really the only thing you can do is reach out for help for yourself because it's not like you're just gonna not a lot of people people in life are just gonna have this epiphany and then they're gonna completely change their ways like you have to really actively get help and it takes a long time <laughs> it takes a long time like i'm not a perfect person and i'm not um my cat wants to jump up there. 
I'm not a perfect person. I still make a lot of mistakes. I'm not like a hundred percent at peace with myself or anything, but, um, <laughs> but, um, Bubba, you can't jump up there. Nope. I'm like really trying at least. I'm like doing the best I can. Um, third question or it's a statement and then <laughs> anyway it's statements and you're supposed to say strongly agree agree and whatnot um I didn't actually want to die um I think I really did want to die like I I d did it and I tried and it didn't work and I didn't, I didn't know any other way to do it so young. And I truly did want to die. I didn't want, I was just a burden and I felt like I didn't have anyone and I felt like no one cared and no one loved me and, and, um, but after that like when it comes to the ideations I think there were times I did still want to die but not fully wholly in my heart because I'm still here today and if I wanted to as I had gotten older then I probably could have found a way <sighs> next is suicide is selfish I strongly disagree. I think that, I mean, I can understand people's points of view when they say, well, you're not thinking of your friends, you're not thinking of your family and all this stuff, but like, how dare you? Like the person who's going through that and is suicidal, that's their last attempt at finding peace. And I'm not saying it's right, but like, I'm not saying, I hope that every single person out there who is suicidal, like gets the help they need and the help they deserve. And decides not to go forward with that but it's not selfish like that person is just in so much pain that they think maybe no one cares or maybe they do think people care but they're just like to them in the moment to me like it felt like a selfless act it's like I'm I'm too much of a burden for everyone and and things would just be easier if I wasn't around and you're thinking more so that way I think most people are when they make that decision and yeah when you attempt, you're attempt, like you're trying and if it doesn't work, but it could have worked and they wouldn't be here today. Um, anyway, I am a happy person. <laughs> well, when I'm doing these videos, obviously I seem extremely unhappy and, and, um, you know, in a lot of my videos, because I'm talking about the past abuse and experience, of course, I'm going to seem extremely unhappy, but that's not my full, it's just because I don't, I'm never going to come into these videos and I'm going to be like putting on a show and I'm going to say things all matter of fact and entertaining and the mask is completely off in my videos. And so I'm not going to be showing you all aspects of me. Like when I talk about suicide and then I say I had a home daycare for four years, like my, most people probably are like, woo, like red flags, like sound the alarm. But I wasn't, um, well, the daycare came after getting help. So I haven't officially been, have any kind of suicidal ideations or anything since 2015 or 2016, roughly. Oh, no. But, um, and you know, I opened my daycare in 2017. Is that too soon after getting help? I mean, I don't know. I don't regret at all having my home daycare. Like the, that was the happiest time of my life. Like 
having a purpose, having the kids, having families, having, I feel like that is the only time in my, almost only the time in my life I experience like true love, like unconditional love where it's like, okay, you're not a perfect person, but you do so much for those kids and they actually love you. And I miss it so much. If I had, even if I was a millionaire, but if I had the funds to do so, I would open a foster care home because I know that my experience makes me like a fighter when it comes to making sure they, the kids didn't have to experience anything I went through. And I just know that I could offer them a safe space where they could grow and learn and actually ask questions and make noise and just be free. But also like I was disciplined in the right ways as well. So it was like, that's something I feel very strongly about is my abilities with that. So, oh, but yes, um, believe it or not, besides these videos, some of them, uh, most of them where you don't get a full picture of like my interests and my what where I actually find joy in life it is a lot of it is very depressing um it's just true and but today I am like a happier person like I'm not exactly where I want to be like one thing is I'm not getting as many hours at work as I had hoped. So things are a struggle financially, but that just happens in life. So I'm just adapting. I'm trying to make choices to save. And um, so this last statement is it gets better. Absolutely. Like I never would have thought back then that I was able to kind of accomplish some of the things I have in life. I never thought that I would get out of that home in that situation. I never thought that I would like live on my own. Well, I guess like I didn't realize how good it could get, but um, I always had those goals for myself. I'm like, oh, I'm going to move away the second I'm done high school and all those things. Like everything I do. Oh, <laughs> my cat. <laughs> Bubba, come here. Everything I really set out to do, I do mostly everything I set out to do that's meant for me, I accomplish and it's, it feels really good. Um, I just feel like everyone out there has that in them. Like find your, find your passion in life and use it as an outlet the best you can, whether it be art or sports or, um, different hobbies like make sure to try to find your people and it really does I mean <laughs> I'm saying it gets better but I've faced a lot of adversities in the workplace in school in relationships abusive toxic relationships with partners and <laughs> but nothing was ever as bad as it was at home. So that's why I feel like it does get better. The hardest part is forcing yourself to make the decision to, to remove yourself from toxic environments. And sometimes it's damn near impossible to do because some people just simply are stuck in poverty and stuck in relationships where they don't have anywhere to go or they feel like they don't have anywhere to go or they would rather be where they are than in a shelter where there's maybe bugs or risk of other types forms of abuse and violence and so I just really feel for the people out there and um but with enough time and with uh, I just really feel there's people out there who are literally like literally trapped in homes and communities like prisoners due to not having the financial means to get themselves out of situations like that. And then some people do get out of these situations and they think they've found support. And then those people only take advantage of them. Like I'm thinking of documentaries where children leave homes and then leave abusive homes and then get put 
put into foster homes where things are only just as bad, if not worse. So it's like, uh, it can be a beautiful world. It can be extremely ugly, but, um, you have to believe it in your heart and you have to do it in a way that's almost kind of like, you know, telling yourself a lie until it does become better. You just have to believe it fully, like manifesting sort of. Anyway, I think my dog really has to go outside. So that's the end of my video today. Um, thank you so much. I know my videos are can be extremely depressing. Um, they're not, it's, um, it's for educational purposes. It's for awareness. It's for, to help others who've been in similar situations. It's, um, you know, like when you're making videos, you're supposed to do these eight steps and then people will like, you know, if you don't do these certain things, your videos aren't going to get pushed to the right audience. But, um, I can't do any of those steps. I can only just do what I'm set out to do. And, um, I'm not going to be doing it in a fun, engaging way. I'm just going to be doing it in a way that only way I know how just explaining things matter, matter of a fact. And, but anyway, thank you so much. Please like, subscribe, and um, okay, my phone's dead, or my phone's low battery and low space on there, but just want to say thank you again for your support, and please like, subscribe, leave a comment. Um, if you're struggling, um, please, like, I don't know if I can put a link of a resource to reach out to because things are probably country by country. But if you are feeling low and feeling suicidal, please reach out for help. Um, even if you think no one cares, people do care. And sometimes those, those crisis phone numbers,